Okay, can we talk for a second about how cool soap is? I mean, from a chemical standpoint, I think everything is cool, but uh, soap is just a really dang cool molecule, and it really uh, hinges on some interesting chemistry. And so I want to talk a little bit about soap and relate it to solubility here, because remember our solubility rules are that like dissolves like. It's kind of the golden rule of solubility in chemistry. Like dissolves like. And because of some cool features of soap molecules, it allows for it to uh, do all the wondrous and amazing things that it does. All right, so let's talk about soap. When you make soap, you have to react a strong base with a fat, and you end up with soap molecules. So you've maybe even made soap at home before. Uh, the strong base that we usually use is lye, which is sodium hydroxide. It's readily available in household kind of items. And then the fat can be anything, any lipid. So fats include oils. It could also include solid fats. I had a friend in undergrad who made bacon soap out of bacon, you know, fat. So <laughs> you can imagine how that smelled. Um, and it's just really um, fundamentally an acid-base neutralization reaction. So the fats are made up of what are called fatty acids. And this is a fatty acid or an example of one. Uh, it's got kind of a short chain because I ran out of paper, but this is just kind of an example of an overall structure. Um, in terms of organic chemistry, this side, this functional group, is a carbonyl, so a carbon double bonded with an oxygen that's also attached to an alcohol group here. So this whole thing is called a carboxylic acid, and that carboxylic acid acts like an acid, hence the name. And this hydrogen can be donated so that's the definition of an acid is something that donates a hydrogen or donates a proton. When it reacts with the sodium hydroxide, then the hydrogen from my fatty acid and the hydroxide from my base neutralize and form water. Water likes to form, so it leaves. And when these things then have their leftover component pieces, now I have a sodium ion, my oxygen is without a hydrogen, so it's just got a little negative charge where there was a hydrogen, so there's some traction here between my sodium and my oxygen, but my oxygen's still connected to that carbonyl. And then the tail on this, I'm just gonna draw, like, um, this is called a skeletal diagram or a backbone diagram that shows this hydrocarbon chain here. So each of these points represents a carbon atom, and each of those carbon atoms are surrounded by as many hydrogens as can be there. So I'm representing kind of my structure here. Um, I have one more hump. If I would have had one more chain out this way, easier to draw in the shorter form. Okay, so um, then this is my soap molecule. This process is called saponification, which is a great vocabulary word. Impress friends, influence others. So saponification. Uh, saponification is the process of creating soaps or um, surfactants, and uh, it comes from a mountain in Italy called Mount Sapo. And so the kind of the story goes back in the Roman Empire, they discovered soap. I mean, that's the theory anyway, is that they discovered soap and Mount Sapo had uh, temples on it. And we know that um, back in the day, especially the Romans would uh, sacrifice animals to their, their pantheon of gods. And when they sacrificed animals, the fats from those animal sacrifices would kind of mix in with the water, they'd run down the streams, and then the women who were washing their clothing in the streams uh, would find that when they'd have their campfires set up, that the campfire would react with the water, and not the fire itself, I'm talking about the ash from the wood, um, which actually contained potassium hydroxide. Potassium hydroxide or potash is the way that it's used to be known. So potassium hydroxide is the strong base and it reacted with the fats from the animal sacrifices and they found that the water would suds up and they could use that sudsy water to um, clean their clothing. And so the knowledge of soap then was around back in the Roman Empire. And when the Roman Empire fell and kind of during the dark ages in Europe, they lost that knowledge of soap. And uh, that's one of the things that they point to that, that allowed for the spread of, you know, the dark, but the Black Death and the bubonic plague, all that kind of stuff um, that they would have been able to prevent better if they would have retained that knowledge of soap. So uh, the reaction is still named after that initial process, saponification. And, um, and 
mentioned yet. So I think that's I think that's interesting. <laughs> All right, so the tail of this soap molecule then is made up of carbon to carbon and carbon to hydrogen bonds. And um, both of these are nonpolar bonds. So we say then that uh, the soap molecule has a nonpolar tail. If we kind of make it animal-like, that sort of looks like a tail. And we say that because these are nonpolar, they don't like to mix with water. So we say that it's hydrophobic. Water fearing, hydrophobic. And then this side of my molecule with the charges and the polarity of the bonds, this is something that water is more interested in. So there's some polarity on this side. We just call this the polar head. You know, if we have a tail on one side, we have the head on the other. And because like dissolves like and water is polar, we would say that this is hydrophilic. In Greek, philia means love. So this would be water loving as opposed to water fearing. So we have one side that's polar, one side that's nonpolar. And because of that kind of distribution within the molecule of one side having one characteristic, the other side having the other characteristic, then it acts as an intermediary between two things. So most grease and grime, grime, kind of oils, fats, most grease and grime, which I'm just kind of representing as a blob there, because I'm picturing kind of when I spill olive oil or something on my counter, then there's a blob of olive oil. And olive oil likes itself, right? Oils like themselves. They, they come up in these little droplets. They're very attracted to themselves. These are all nonpolar things. Anything that's got an oily texture to it is going to be nonpolar. So this gre grease, grime, and oils um, is its own thing. And we know that water molecules are polar. So I have my water molecule with that negative charge slightly on my oxygen and a slight positive charge on my hydrogens. When I try to mix the two together, they don't mix. You've experienced this in your kitchen. Or if you've ever gotten like butter on your hands, for example, and then you go to wash them, but you don't get soap first. So you just kind of smear the butter around on your hands and then you put the soap on there and then you can wash it off, right? Because the butter is interested in the oils on your fingers, right? So it's much more interested in that than leaving until you have to get soap involved. So we can't use water alone, like dissolves like. So we have a non-polar grease and grime. We have polar water molecules and never the twain shall meet. But if we get a soap molecule in there, then now the nonpolar tail of the molecule, and I'm just gonna, now it's gonna look a little bit like a balloon. It's a party when we're talking about soap. So this tail part is gonna start to dissolve the grease and the grime because like dissolves like. So this is nonpolar, this is nonpolar. So they're all about each other. This head though is not all about the grease, it's all about the water molecules. So there's an attraction here, there's a stickiness here between the polar head, the hydrophilic head, and the water molecules. So then if I was to throw that grease and grime into water, and then I throw some soap in there, then these, these soap molecules are gonna start to surround my grease and my grime and my oil. Now it really looks like a party. So again, I'm kind of stylizing these soap molecules here to where those nonpolar bits are starting to dissolve the nonpolar grease and grime and the polar heads then are exposed to be able to interact with the water. There we go. That's good. Now, and you can picture this in three dimensions too. So this would be coming out at you. They'd be going back into the page. You'd have this little essentially ball, this little uh, encapsulation of this grease by these soap molecules. And this whole little thing is called a micelle. And it's going to form this way because like dissolves like, right? If I had the polar thing on the inside, right? If that was the smaller amount of things, then the soap molecules would be in the opposite direction, right? But because the grease and the grime is the smaller bit, um, it's going to be surrounded by these soap molecules. And then the polar heads are going to be available to interact with the water and dissolve in the water. And this is kind of a cool thing. You've probably seen this before. If you do dishes by hand, we know that oil is less dense than water. So it'll rise to the surface of your water. So if you do dishes by hand and you have your dishes soaking in the sink, 
and then you see the oils from your dishes um, raising to the surface of the water and then you put a little soap into your sink you'll see everything kind of spread out right so everything sort of spreads out and then when you look again you see these little droplets smaller droplets now of the oil and you, that oil that you're seeing the smaller droplets of it are these micelles that have been now surrounded by your soap molecules um, and now they're ready to be whisked away whereas before it was just kind of a blob of oil on top of your dirty dish sink water okay so uh, like dissolves like is our general rule and because of the polar and nonpolar parts of my soap molecules it can act as an intermediary between uh, nonpolar substances and polar substances and so that's kind of how it works pretty cool huh